Now, the much-anticipated documentary on corruption in football in Ghana was finally premiered to a packed auditorium at the Crown International Conference Center on Wednesday. Number 12, as investigative journalist Anas Aremi Anas calls it, is said to show how much officials and executives of the Ghana Football Association allowed themselves to be easily compromised to fix matches and influence decisions. There were so many who turned up to watch hundreds more were left outside when the doors were shut for the first viewing. Ernest Menu, who is one of those who have seen the documentary, joins me with some live update. Hello, Ernest. So you tell me what you saw in the documentary. Hello, Israel. Good to see you. So we can start from the uh, DFA, from the NSA, uh, where Mr. Sunny Dara, uh, the NSA, I beg your pardon, where the Public Affairs Director, the Vice uh, Boss of the NSA, you remember, he was suspended after the Australia uh, Commonwealth Games saga. So he was suspended by the President uh, following that issue. Saga I had already investigated this before it, it came into the news. And uh, for the GFK, Sunny Dara, he took some 4,000 Ghana cities in order to field a player, uh, uh, to call up a player into the Black Stars. And to the uh, GFA board himself, the senior institute, he made some claims as far as the president is concerned. He said that uh, the deputy transport minister, Anthony Abai Fakabo, was his small boy and that um, he could get him, uh, lead them to see the president. Um, he, the, the, the Tiger Eye team, however, met Mr. Nyantiki to uh, the, the, the president of the GFA in the Upper West Region 1, Al Hassan, who is also called Abu. Uh, he arranged a meeting with the GFA and Tiger Eye, uh, and it was at the meeting that Mr. Nyantiki made all these allegations that um, he had the rapport with the president. He knows the president very well. The vice president is his friend. In fact, it's his brother. Those were his words. And that he could get them to give them uh, duty deals. Uh, the people had come initially to invest $15 million into the uh, Ghana football by way of sponsorship for three years. Uh, but after that deal, the Indonesian team went further to talk about, you know, deals in the road sector, in the sport expansion and what are these because we realized that they had a lot of money. So again, in the video, he asked that they could give the president three million, the vice president two million, the deputy road, uh, road transport minister one million, uh, so that they could see the president. However, it will cost them about $12 million because they need to settle some other people as well. And so these are some of the revelations that came up. Now, he also claims that it is very important to involve the Athens Central MP Kennedy in Japan, who he says is very influential in this government because he is the financier. Now, he says that the state Japan uh, was offered a ministerial appointment, but he turned it down because he claimed he does not have the discipline to be a minister. And so the Ministry of Transport was virtually handed over to him, and he appointed someone of his choice, which is the Tiyama, uh, says, to the ministry. So as far as uh, Nyantiki is concerned, uh, the deputy, the Minister of Transport, the Tiyama, who uh, you know, is in charge of many of the road contracts, is, this is a small boy, as it were, of uh, uh, Kennedy in Japan, as well as the death. So these are some of the issues that came up uh, in this documentary. All uh, right. Um, All right. Thank you very much, uh, Ernest Menu. And we will be coming to you uh, for reactions uh, from the people that who have watched and uh, who you are standing by with. But here in the studio, I have with me Nathan Gaduga of MyJoyOnline.com. He has also seen the documentary and we'll be chatting with him in a bit. But there are some excerpts of this documentary that came out shortly before the premiere went out. And uh, let me just show you a bit of it. So the first one has one of the officials of the executives of the Ghana Football Association uh, who is seen or captured on video taking some monies supposedly to be bribes. Let's watch this one.
the Nyantechi yeah. one. We'll go to the Nyantechi all right, so, and there's another video which shows the Ghana Football Association president, Kwesi Nyantechi, making some remarks. Let's hear him out. Start with something small, your own discretion. Then, when you get the contract, big, big contract, we can go back and give them more money. Then, then we we'll take over the whole country. All right, so... We're back in the studio and I have with me uh, Nathan Gaduga. As I indicated earlier, he has seen the entire documentary and uh, he's going to be explaining to us what exactly we're just seeing right now in the excerpts that we've shown to you. So the first one, we see, we see an executive of the Ghana Football Association, a Greater Accra yeah. executive. What's in there? Basically what's in there is um, an approach was made to him um, to ensure that a player be granted audience into the black stars and basically that was given a the chance to be featured giving the opportunity the to be um, featured in the black stars and the opportunity was given to him and then the money too was given to him i think it was about four thousand ghana cities uh, if i if i remember correctly but that was the amount given to him to influence um the coach to get a player into the black stars and uh, that happened uh, at the oh, end of the day, the player was not actually um, giving the audience at the blasters, but the mere fact that he took the money suggested that this is somebody who, when given the opportunity, he would be able to it's do It's corruptible, that. essentially. Yeah. All right, then the second video that we've just seen, the Kwesinyati. Essentially, that's, that's the meeting between um, Kwesinyati and the supposed investor who has now turned out to be the Tiger Eye um, representatives. And what actually we saw there was... Um, a discussion of um, how to sponsor the local league. That was the first transaction that was um, the transaction between Kwesinyatichi and then the supposed investor. And then there was the business leg of how that supposed investor is supposed to invest into Ghana as well by building um, bridges and other contracts that that supposed investor is supposed to um, get himself involved in. So what basically happened was Kwesinya Tichi was uh, introduced to this investor. He was to discuss with him how best the FA, the um, um, Ghana Premier League will be sponsored. And as you may well um, already know, the football has not, the Premier League has not been sponsored for three years. And so this transaction was um, geared towards finding a prospective sponsor for the local league. It turned out that after the discussion, an amount of um, $50 million was suggested by the um, prospective investor as sponsorship for the local league. And surprisingly, Christina Tichi actually um, discussed with him the possibility of having a company formed. And that company is supposed to be more or less a broker for this deal. And 20% of um, the sponsorship sum would go to this broker. Sort of an agency. An agency. And that agency is supposed to be in his name or his partners. And there was this um, Tamale um, FA chair. He's, he's supposed to be the right-hand man for Kwesinya teaching. In almost all the deals, in almost all the transactions that have gone on, it is this man who has been fronting for Kwesinya teaching in almost all the deals they have transacted so far. All right, so you have seen this documentary. Apart from these two highlights or excerpts we've talked about, what would you say was your highlight or were your highlights? Basically, it's about football, the bribery and corruption in football and the roles referees have played to change the fortunes or the outcomes of games. And there's been so many examples of how dubious penalty kicks have been given or have, have been awarded to one team or the other. And I think typical of it was the Hearts of Oak, um, Kumasi Asante Kotoko game where um, a dubious penalty, if you would say so, was awarded Hearts of Oak, where um, a Kotoko player dived, a shot was hit, and then the referee said the ball took a ricochet off the Kotoko player's hand and awarded um, a penalty. It turned out that before that particular match, an amount of money was given to the referee for the, for the day. His name is uh, Samuel Suka, I guess. So he took money before that particular game and then he awarded a dubious uh, penalty for Accra Hearts of Oak. But let me just say that there were other instances where monies were actually given to the referees and then 
on the field of play, dubious decisions were actually taken against the team that paid. It tells you that what may perhaps have happened was Somebody the other paid team more. paid more. So even though they took the money to um, officiate in favor of the person who gave him the money, he went and did virtually the opposite, took dubious decisions against the people who paid, which may suggest, well, we don't have proof for that one, but it may suggest that the other team may perhaps have, may perhaps have paid more for that. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nathan uh, Gaduga. Now, we're going back to the Crown International Conference Center. The screening is still ongoing. In fact, today, there are going to be four viewings or four showings. There's one at, that went out at three. There's one that went out at five. There's going to be one at eight and uh, I believe another one at ten. Now, Ernest Main is standing by with the GJA President Afil Moni at the Crown International Conference Center, who has just uh, also watched the documentary and uh, he's going to be sharing his thoughts with us so Ennis uh, so you talk to the GJ president okay so uh, easy we have the GJ president uh, Afal Moni here remember that the GJ issued a statement uh, asking the, for police protection for Anas because uh, his life was on, in danger this was after the Asin Central MP had published pictures that were allegedly his pictures and they said that this was exposing him to danger in fact they described it as murderous intent and so mr money thanks for joining us on join his prime can you draw closer uh, what are your impressions after watching this documentary i believe you all came with um, varying degrees of, uh, of expectations and um, what we have seen and what we have heard have all triggered the magnitude, magnitude of shock which can be described as earth shattering. Earth shattering in the sense that uh, the degree of revelations, I believe, have shaken the very foundations of our football and to a very large extent um, the nature of politics in this country. The uh, magnitude of influence peddling by 30 people who can drop names, the biggest name in this country, that's the presidency, to attend to war investors and to um, satisfy their uh, uh, personal uh, 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 greed. Um, we believe that um, um, announced by the extensive nature of his investigative piece, the level of sacrifice he has put into this, into this work and what has come out, the outcome of all this, have all justified what he has done. Indeed, they have um, justified the rectitude of the methods he has used. Many of those who were questioning his methodology, the models of Randy and, and others, because they, 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 they have the view that uh, Anansi's style offends the law, Anansi's style is ethically um, um, unscrupulous. But um, before we even um, watch the video, some of us know put our, um, uh, our, our integrity on the line, put our necks, we came out to defend him to, to the extent of calling for police protection for him because uh, we know what he has done, we know his track record, his track record, record which um, strikes cause, cause of appreciation nationally and internationally. So as we speak, Anas Arimia Anas is one of the purest gems when it comes to investigative journalism. And it is instructive to note that his style of investigative journalism is, is a subject which is taught in American schools. And um, the, one of the topmost caliber of journalists in the whole wide world. So we, 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 we have no choice than to mount rose tinted defense of his style because uh, we have subjected what he has done to our Article 13 of our Code of Ethics, and as far as we are concerned, his investigative piece is ethical wholesome. There's nothing wrong with that. And when it um, subjected to sting operations, again, um, what, uh, what is done 
does not offend the law is purely in line with sting operations, which um, does not frown on going undercover to an earth dark spot and sends both perpetrators. So, so as far as you're concerned, his approach is fine by the GJA. You think that as far as it is going into the fight against corruption, uh, it is okay and it is ethically correct for him to, uh, to, to approach his uh, investigations in this style. Uh, but let's talk about the police protection you sought for him. How far have we come with that? Um, we, we have um, ventilated our concern about uh, Anas's safety. Anas did speak to us. And um, Anas is somebody who is unflappable, unflappable under such conditions because he fully, is fully aware of the implications of what he does and the danger to which he's always exposed. But for once, Anas spoke in a manner which suggested that um, um, he, he felt that his life was in danger more than ever before. Okay. So that prompted us to issue that statement. Yeah. And, um, you said you were going to meet with the police. What is the latest on that? We have had some informal discussion. As I said, um, I was an executive member had a discussion with that of CID, uh, uh, Ms. T. and um, um, we, we, we underlined the need for the police to extend that cover of protection for ANA because ANAS is a huge, in fact, a, 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 a priceless national asset. Uh, that, that, that is clear. Let's talk about the documentary. What do you expect to be done after this? There are calls for an overhaul of the GFA, of the NSA, and all of that. Uh, some are suggesting before that is even done, they should resign. Uh, what, what, what will be the role of government in this? As a journalist, he's put out the work there. But just like with the DVLA, just like with uh, even with the judiciary, some say we have still not been able to deal with corruption. What do you think? should be done. In, the, in, in, in terms of the judiciary, again, it took a nurse um, who is physically cute, but professionally huge, to shake the very foundations of a judiciary to the extent that scores of judges were, were, were dismissed. It's a plus for a nurse, it's a plus for Ghana journalism. Again, it took a nurse to also expose some wrongdoings at the port and other circles. And um, we, we, we do know that uh, um, evidence, evidence is, is an indispensable weapon in fighting corruption. Anas has provided the evidence so copiously that nobody, nobody can now uh, use the lack of evidence as an excuse for, not, for inaction. So you so expect government to pick this up? Government, we expect um, our football authorities to act with urgent promptitude to tackle the, the rot in our football, the rot in certain circles of, of our politics from, from the root and not the branch. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Afalmoni. He's president of the GJA. We'll speak to uh, another person who has watched the video uh, uh, just to get his, uh, his thoughts we'll, on that. We'll have but to we'll come back up, to you uh, on that. Ever, uh, Yes, we'll have to come back to you on that uh, because there are some other stories. And uh, now there are ramifications. The ramifications of the Anas video is also uh, in, in Parliament. We're having ramifications there where the uh, MP, MP for Singh Central, Kennedy Japong, is withheld before the Privileges Committee for comments he made about the House. We'll bring you that story in a bit. Stay tuned. It shows gross incompetence. Welcome back to Join News Prime. Now, Singh Central MP Kennedy Ejepong is to appear before Parliament's Privileges Committee for possible disciplinary action over alleged contemptuous comments made against the House. According to Minority Chief Whip Muntaka Mubarak, the MP in an interview described Parliament as useless for electing Osei Chemin Sambonsu as leader. Okay. <laughs> Osei Chairman Sabonsu will be disgraced if I release the evidence I have on him. Are you out of your mind? I have much more experience in life than Chairman Sam. Even though he's older, I will deal with him if he misbehaves. What I earn from Parliament is peanuts compared to how much I spend. We need to stop Anas. 
and find genuine investigators. He shouldn't make himself as a thing good. Why are you talking about this? We see a four hundred. One zero seven point one. Now, Mr. Mubarak moved a motion on the floor of the House for Mr. Jepong to be investigated for the comments and got the backing of the majority side of the House. Very unpalatable. Just for the sake of you, I'll just, use, I'll just refer to only one. And not, I have the video and I have a lot of the publication. To have referred to Parliament as cheap, useless. The speaker, I have the tape here. Our colleague is referring to this house as a cheap and useless house. And just to paraphrase, that if this house was not useless, you don't have the like of our uh, leader, Honorable Oseche Mesabosu, to be its leader. The speaker, I find this very offensive, unbecoming of a member of, uh, a member of parliament, and for the past week or so, He's been on rampaging insults. Mr. Speaker, I'm coming under this to move that our honorable colleague, Honorable Kennedy, Ejapon, be referred to the Privilege Committee on the basis of his conduct and utterances against this House, against the majority leader, and against many well meaning Ghanaians. I so move, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The pronouncement of our honorable colleague, is becoming unbecoming. The leader, the minor, majority leader, is the leader of government business in this house. And this, if we were running a parliamentary democracy, you would have been the prime minister. The speaker, and we say that it is precisely because this is our parliament, the parliament of the Republic of Ghana, Guaranteed and sanctioned by the Constitution of Ghana, which Constitution gives you the right, the freedom of expression, is a useless parliament. And we are foolish, including Mr. Speaker. <laughs> and it's precisely because we are foolish. It's precisely because we are foolish. That is why we have elected the Majority leader to preside over the business of government in this house. Mr. Speaker, and over, and, and over the foolishness that we do in this house. Mr. Speaker, I don't think we are that foolish. Mr. Speaker, I don't think we are that foolish. So the minority MPs started it, but the majority MP supports the motion, which the Speaker eventually approved. Uh, for me, what, uh, what is contemptuous is contemptuous irrespective of who is making that contemptuous statement. For now, we can only proceed on the assumption that the honorable member made those statements. We need to give him the opportunity to clear himself. And the opportunity can only be availed to the honorable member if he appears before a committee, because this matter has gone viral it's all over the place, and we need to clear, he needs to clear his name, and we need to clear the dignity of Parliament. On that score, I support the call by my colleague, the Minority Chief Whip, that the matter be referred to Privileges Committee to delve into the matter, either to establish the truth or otherwise of the allegation. Mr. Speaker, I support the call. It is always important for all of us to get the opportunity to clear our names when we are cited. In the heat of anger, which I am of the view should not even be too much associated with a man who is supposed to represent a crowd, your capacity to control your temper is evidence of maturity. And if in the fit of anger you want to come and denigrate this house, and the leader and the rest of them. So therefore, if where we make the laws of this country is an assembly of buffoons, oh please, this will be investigated, coming from anybody. Because we've been entrusted to bring about the laws of this country. 
So we have the sanity. The sanity of this country is in our hands. People don't know what lawmaking is all about. Lawmaking is how people begin to come under law so that men will not exalt themselves above law. Sing Central is alleged to have uttered words that this house is a foolish assembly of members. Otherwise, we would not elect the majority leader as the leader of the house. If indeed he uttered those words, they are clearly against order 28 and order 30 rule 2. In the circumstances, I direct that Mr. Kennedy Ohini Ejapong, Honorable Member for Asin Central, appears before the Privileges Committee for the committee to determine whether indeed he uttered those words which are attributed to him, and if so, recommend the appropriate sanctions to the House. All right, so that invitation to the Asin Central MP has since been made. Uh, official or documented we have uh, an invitation or we have a document coming from parliament it uh, says uh, dear editor uh, for immediate release the member of parliament for sin central the honorable kennedy ohine japong has been referred to the committee of privileges for comments he is alleged to have made which seeks to bring the name of parliament into distribute as per article 112 of the 1992 constitution and order 28 of the standing orders of the parliament of ghana the referral made under Order 31 of the Standing Orders is for the committee to determine the veracity or otherwise of the said comments attributed to the Honourable Member and to afford the Honourable Member the opportunity to be heard on the allegations. Dates for the committee hearings will be communicated at the appropriate time to the general public and is signed by the Acting Director of uh, Public Affairs of Parliament, Kate Addo. In uh, staying with Parliament, the minority has called for the resignation of the Director General of the Police Criminal Investigations Department over the leakage to the media of the statement given to the police by the Ghana Football Association President Kwesi Nyantechi on the Anas expose. They say the inability of Mamiya Tiwa Adodankwa to prevent such a confidential document from getting into the media space is evidence of her incompetence. Speaking to Joe News' parliamentary correspondent Joseph Pukugapo, Minority Chief Whip Muntaka Mubarak says, although it is important for the Defence and Interior Committee of Parliament to summon the minister to answer questions, the CID boss must bow her head in shame and vacate her post immediately. It is shocking that a witness statement, the headquarters, not at the district or in a small police station, can lead to the media. It shows gross incompetence. And in a world established democracy, I don't think the director CID needs to wait for someone to tell her to resign and go. Because she has failed to keep the public trust. And she doesn't deserve to be there. She just have to go. She just have to resign. And I will encourage the committee of parliament, that's the Interior and Defence Committee, to summon the Minister of Interior and the Police Administration to answer how this has happened. But the head, who is the head? She has, she has failed grossly. I am going to make sure that the committee on Interior, Defence and Interior, summon them. If they fail to do that, I will file a question. If that doesn't get done, obviously I'll bring a motion. This is the crust of it. Because a number of times you hear, I mean, I remember very well that when, during the time for the uh, double salary issues, people go there and the next day, the matter is the daily guide. How do they get the information? But all along, I always thought that, oh, they are conjecturing or maybe they are just paraphrasing or maybe somebody easily just give them a, a, a whist drop or something. But now I'm convinced that, I'm now convinced that this gross failure of keeping confidentiality of documents there. And she has the place. We're taking a break here on Join News Prime, but still ahead, Chief Executive of Org All Storage and Transportation Company and its counterpart at the Ghana Port and Naval Authority removed from office in a wave of dismissals 
uh, state-owned enterprises. But uh, up next in business uh, with Emmanuel Wadiyafi, the president has been talking about uh, the new uh, flag carrier partner for the flag carrier of Ghana. Uh, president Tukufado actually has announced the process to find a partner for the flag carrier. We have that coming up. Stay tuned. Hello, good evening. Time for business now. And President Akufuado has announced the process to find a partner for the creation of a new home-based carrier will be finalized by the end of the year. The Minister for Evasion, Cecilia Dapa, had mentioned earlier that three airlines, Air Mauritius, Ethiopian Air and Indigenous Carrier Africa World Airlines, were in competition to partner the state to establish a new home-based carrier. The President was speaking at the short curtain ceremony for the commencement of the second phase of the Kumasi International Airport development. President Akufuado, in the company of other ministers, cut sword for the construction of a new terminal building at the Kumasi International Airport and the extension of the current runway. The cost of the project is estimated at 66 million 350 thousand euros and expected to be completed within 24 months. The capacity of the new terminal is estimated to be 1 million passengers a year. President Akufuado in his speech indicated that there are talks to get a national carrier by end of the year. The Ministry of Aviation, under the strong leadership of Cecilia Dapa, has over the course of the last year been engaging potential investors, domestic and foreign, to partner with government to establish a national carrier. I'm reliably informed that the process should be completed by the end of the year. Indeed, other projects in the pipeline, including include the commencement of the second phase of Tamale Airport and the rehabilitation of Sunyani Airport. The whole and why airports have now been completed and will soon become operational. The aviation minister Cecilia Dapa says there are also plans to ensure straight flights from Kumasi through Accra to the final destination. We have since last year been discussing with the airlines operating in the country to consider making the necessary arrangements for flight tickets to originate from Kumase so that passengers will transit in Accra. Thus, tickets will read Kumase Accra Dubai, Kumase Accra Paris, Kumase Accra Abidjan, or Kumase Accra Abuja. <laughs> Mr. President, we are also in talks with local investors and entrepreneurs to be encouraged to set up strong airlines to make use of the aviation infrastructure and the nation's route rights to bring in investment and boost tourism. Managing Director of Ghana Airport Company Limited, John Dechem Atefwa, reviewed plans for construction of an airport city is in the often. The airport city will have a combination of corporate offices and commercial businesses including shopping malls, hotels, and fast food centers similar to the Accra Airport City One. On the fact that Kumasi Airport is the second busiest airport after Kutuka International Airport, and this expansion will provide airlines operating in Ghana with the opportunity to develop additional routes that will be beneficial to passengers traveling from Kumasi to other parts of Africa and the world. Prince Apia, reporting. Ghana Gas has confirmed that a significant amount of VRA's debt to the institution has been cleared. The total debt, which was running into billions of Ghana cities, affected operations of the company. Speaking to Joy Business on the sidelines of the Petroleum Hub Conference, Chief Executive of Ghana Gas, Dr. Ben Asante, said the development has greatly improved its operations. Starting 2018, the, we've got probably better news than in the past. VRA has started actually remitting some of the money to us, paying some of the money to us. We 
still will hope for more, um, but it is encouraging to see that they've started paying some of the monies for the debt that they owe us. So that is really what I'm saying. Has this improved your position as we speak right now, or uh, it's still a long way to go? Yes, I think, I, th I think it certainly has improved our position from what it was last year in terms of our liquidity. Because I tell you, um, if you are getting, you know, some millions now to your bottom line, I think you'll be happy that not getting anything at all, as it was in the past. If you look in the, uh, at the past, um, our fuel supply has been a little erratic. And uh, Ghana Gas, in the last year or two, I would say last year or two, has been able to maintain its end of the bargain in terms of providing reliable and sustainable gas supply to the West. Now, the West was um, notable for actually using a lot of the light crude oil for power generation. But in recent times, I think they've been relying more on gas supply from the Atuabo fields. Gas that is processed through the Atuabo processing plant and transported through our pipeline to Abuazi for power generation. That obviously will cut down on the other alternative fuel, which was light crude, mm. which was used for power generation. Mm. And we are very happy about that, mm. that we've contributed modestly to this uh, um, good story. In, in percentage-wise, uh, what can we consider 50-50 in terms of crude, i.e. gas, or 70-30, or even 40-60? I think my understanding now, in, in, in terms of, of uh, how much gas um, we use versus how much crude we use in the West, probably would be something around maybe 70-30. Now the Ghana Revenue Authority, GRA, has closed down media company Metro TV for non-payment of taxes to the tune of 2.3 million Ghana cities. The media company has been put under audit and is therefore excluded from any tax amnesty. Assistant Commissioner in Charge of Public Affairs and Communications at the GRA, Bobi Ansa, has been speaking with Joy Business on the shutdown. Charles Aite has more. The tax force from the Debt Management Compliance Enforcement Unit of GRA invaded the premises of Metro TV to close down the station for non-compliance with tax laws. Metro TV, according to GRA, owes 2.3 million cities in unpaid taxes. Kwesi Bobiansa is the Assistant Commissioner in Charge of Public Affairs at the GRA. So we're currently here at Metro TV where the GRA Task Force is currently stationed to, you know, clamp down the building. Actually, they are shutting down this building due to what they have described to be uh, issues related to uh, being defaulting tax, taxes in uh, excess of 2.3 million Ghana cities. I have the Deputy uh, GRA Commissioner in charge of, uh, Assistant Commissioner in that regard to help us understand what exactly is going on here at Metro TV. So thank you very much, Mr. Bobi and sir. What exactly is happening here? What is happening is uh, that we conducted an audit here, I mean, as far as the company is concerned, and we came up with a debt. The total is 2.3 million Ghana cities, made up of PAY, that is pay as you earn, which are the reduction from workers' salaries, and VAT. So in actual fact, it is not even corporate tax. This, uh, uh, a company or an employer acts as an agent for the GRA. So when you deduct the PYE or you, you get the VAT from the people you do business with, you are supposed to pay to the GRA. They have not paid. And then from 2014 to 2018. So we put it to, together. We added interest penalty, what we call incidental expenses, and they all came to 2.3. So we are here to execute a distress action. Workers of the station were asked to vacate the premises as the entire department, editorial bench, and studios of the TV station have been shut down. Bobby Ansa says Metro TV has currently been placed under audit. GRE, we are serious about collecting taxes to develop this country. Let me also take this opportunity to, to, to add that GRA is implementing a tax amnesty regime. Companies that is which are owing, they have or businesses which are owing, they have the opportunity and if which are owing, they have the opportunity to come and pay the tax without the penalties and interest. For companies, business which we have not yet registered, they have the opportunity to come forward, we will waive the taxes, the interest and the penalties. But we wish to inform them that after 30th September, that is where the tax amnesty, am, am, GRE will come after them. 
This is the second time the GRA has shut down Metro TV. The station was closed down in December 2017. The Laboni-based television station was acquired by just one group of companies this year after the past owners faced some challenges. And that's all by way of business tonight. Many thanks for watching. My name is Imano Abwaji Riafi. Have a good evening. Now, President Akufuado has terminated the appointment of the Director General of the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority. A copy of the termination letter cited by Joy News and signed by the Secretary to the President asked Edward Kofiose to proceed to collect his three month salary in lieu of the notice and any other terminal benefits or facilities due him and relevant law on his contract. The GPHA boss's removal is one of several terminations emanating from the presidency on Wednesday. Others removed include the chief executive of the Bulk All Storage and Transport Company, boss. Joseph Opokugaku joins me in the studio with details of the terminations. Now, Joseph, how many uh, terminations and all came through on Tuesday? So, um, a number of them, we've been able to confirm two specific ones. So, uh, that of the Ghana Post and Harbors Authority. So, it's actually Paul Ansa, and he's been asked to hand over to Edward Osei. All right. So, the, the, the person whose contract has been terminated is actually Paul Ansa. All right. You know, he has worked with the port for uh, well, quite a while. Now. Yes, yeah. even before the NDC administration came to power, the MPP administration came to power. I think he was then, uh, with marketing. Uh, yes, so. and public affairs uh, sections handling that particular division. And when President Akufado took over in uh, early 2017, then he was made the um, chief executive. Um, one other person who's uh, appointment we've confirmed has been terminated is Alfred Obeng, the chief executive of, of Boss. Boss, the bulk of storage and, and distribution company. And, and, and you recall that in, in that particular case, there have been um, a number of concerns that have come up about how he's managed there. The minority in parliament have repeatedly claimed there's been cases of corruption. They've raised issues with uh, contamination of fuel, which was eventually so that reduced prices and all. And, and, and then with the GPH boss, uh, you, you'd recall just about a week ago the management, uh, you, you know, particularly the, the, the tussle between the, the board chairman and the, the union. Peter McMenu and then the union staff. And um, that had resulted in, you know, a, a situation of um, management there uh, coming up with uh, a lot of issues that needed to be dealt with. And so you've seen the termination of his contract as well. Uh, but as well, you've got an indication that the gentleman in charge of SNET. Um, may, may as well go. There, there also been talk about the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, uh, indication that the chief executive as well may go, and um, a number of other institutions. The GPHA, the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, uh, Gifty Clenham, the former member of parliament who used to head that particular institution. There are again indications that that's another organization where uh, the head has been asked to go. And um, more of the names keep trickling in by the hour. All right. So there's, there's, there's been a raft of these uh, removals, or we're hearing of some of, of some of them. Do we know what is informing all of this? Uh, government has indicated that there's a restructuring exercise that's going on at the level of the state-owned enterprises. And so they would want to inject a lot more uh, effectiveness. They would want to uh, in inject a lot more in, uh, you know, energy. Uh, there is a deliberate effort to get some of these institutions to, on their own, make as much profit as they can so they can be independent institutions. And um, as far as government is concerned, that effort to do that requires that um, some new leadership take the helm of affairs in a number of these agencies. Hence, the decision to push the chief executives out. But um, we obviously cannot ignore those agencies where we've seen agitations come up and probably link that to how come we've seen uh, some of the chief executives being made to go. But um, as we're saying, it looks like um, we've not seen the last of it yet. There's been agitations from the constituency where Polansa, for example, hails right. from yes, so a German constituency. The NPP executives there have begun uh, making demands and issuing statements and demanding uh, his reinstatement. We'll see how the tussle between the party at that level and the presidency goes. All right. And, and all the way forward. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph Opokugaku. But I'd like to share with you what uh, Joseph was just telling us about the agitations coming from the constituency of the uh, Director General of the uh, Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority. Now, so you can, as you can see on the uh, on, on the screens, the New Patriotic Party's polling station and constituency executives such as Suja Manning in the Eastern Region have threatened to resign on Mars 
if SAC CEO of the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority is not reinstated. Paula Asari Ansa was relieved of his post by the president, Nana Dudan Kwekufado, on Tuesday. A letter signed by the president's executive secretary, Nana Santivide, to order Mr. Ansa uh, should hand over uh, his office by Friday. So, as we indicated, the letter uh, didn't quite indicate why that uh, he had been asked to step aside. But as you can see, a copy of the letter there on uh, uh, my. Uh, on myjoyonline.com and you can get to read uh, a lot more of it on the website. In other news, so far at the Tema Technical Institute have asked students to go home for a week over a bed bag infestation at the school. After protests on the campus Tuesday, the boarders resolved not to attend classes until the situation is resolved. Some of the students accuse management of turning a blind eye to their complaint. Correspondent Kwame Yanka's report. When the new team got to the school, students were seen with their belongings moving out in groups. Others were seen loitering as they did not see the one week break coming. Apart from bed bugs, students say insanitary conditions in the school, including unclean washrooms, are among reasons behind the agitation. Some students have been speaking to join news. For a whole week, we are not going to learn. Yeah, we are not going to learn for a whole week, and it's, not, it's going to disturb us a lot. According to the borders, they weren't able to sleep yesterday because the bed bags level was very high, and it was very um, disturbing. So this morning, I came to school and I realized, ah, almost all the borders are not in class. All I can find is a day students. Meanwhile. Management of Tema Technical says there are plans to fumigate the dormitories before the students return next week. However, the issue of absence of water was disputed as reservoirs have been filled to improve access to water. Kwame Yanka's report for Joy News. Over 100 suspected internet forces, popularly known as Sakawa, have been arrested by the Kaswa police in the soup Wednesday morning. According to the police, several items, including 126 laptops and a pump action gun, were retrieved from the suspect at Gumwa Nyanyano in three surrounding communities in the central region. Kaswa Divisional Police Commander ACP Ajimang Ajim says the objective of the soup is to minimize activities of criminals terrorizing residents. We've had information that Kaswa is turning out to be the center for internet fraud. And so we organized soups this dawn at four places. Uh, that is Gumwa, Nyanyano, Akwele, Adade, and Obum Road. In total, we arrested about 126 persons and we retrieved about the same number of laptops. We also retrieved 40 mobile phones, nine passports, one pump action gun with eight live ammunition, uh, some cash, and two modems that were being used in their operations. And these uh, persons had furnished a large room that was in all the areas. They had large rooms where they had tables and computers lined up like you find in the uh, internet center. And that is how they operate and scam people. And so we stormed and arrested them. Um, we are going to process them. Those who are found to have um, been involved in any of these scams will be processed to court. And of course, um, there are some foreign nationals involved and will let their embassies know and uh, proper action will be taken. It was constructed and open to traffic in 2012 to ease commuting, but what was to reduce traffic congestion on the achimota Pukwasi Highway is turning out to be a death trap as the slightest rainfall leaves the Fanko barrier section of the interchange heavily flooded with vehicles and homes submerged. Joining us Komladum, who visited the area a few minutes after a 20-minute downpour, reports residents and drivers alike fear they may not be lucky to escape the next time it rains. It's Sunday afternoon. Students of the Anglican School at Ofankor Barrier are done with the final revision, 
before Monday's first paper of this year's BEC. They emerged from under a staircase where the exercise was held and tiptoe across the mud stained compound. Rainwaters had swept through the entire school premises, leaving visible mud traces in its wake. Apart from the school, the entire interchange at Ofranco Barrier was affected. Vehicles were almost submerged in flood waters. 45 year old taxi driver here, Felix, was caught up in the ensuing vehicular congestion. He's been living here for over a decade and he tells me it didn't rain for long, yet the place was heavily flooded. <laughs> It rained for only 20 minutes, but this whole area was flooded. I mean, the reason why I flooded the area more, sir. Not be able to move. As we're submerged, even my taxi was submerged. Until you had the flood in there, you should not talk as if about too much. Reflects over the situation six years ago when the interchange was opened to traffic. To me from, but I can't get into the area. I'm to me from. It's unlike the other flood incident. I suspect the drains here are choked. This was devastating. Authorities should step in fast before we lose lives. Two people are so seven days here, but it's too high. Pass up a crab, thirty minutes. Ah, can be a west. Can be nimble. Never happen. Alex fears the situation could get worse if something isn't done about the situation. But he is of a firm belief drains here, which hitherto carried flood waters when it rains, have been blocked. And the sighting of a shell filling station here about three years ago is partly to blame. A uh, filling station what? Eh, ba 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 stop hano mano. Insoni nam kwa ni eni gota from onangasa yini gota ni nam kwa ni vifi. Buka miti muse gota ni muasi. Eh, wa filling station na eh hano. Problem ni na vifi filling station. Mi nim sini ya omo ya filling station the way omo timi cover a ya fence ni gota ni sana ama insoni ba ebu fast web. From what I gather, not much has been done by way of flood prevention here. And residents fear with the next downpour, their homes, properties and livelihoods will be washed away. On the walls of this structure, not too far from the interchange, ruins of a flood are visible. Madame Yawa, not her real name, speaks of the devastation the rains cause every time it rained. <laughs> It was terrible. The road, the school, our homes were all flooded. Right, we're re returning to our very first story, which has to do with the Anas Expose number 12, which premiered at the Crime International Conference Center. Ernest Menu is standing by to bring us a, a live update. Hello, Ernest. Now, we understand that there have been uh, challenges with people accessing the auditorium for the e event. And, uh, now, rushing to the terrace. Uh, this is the entrance to the terrace. And everybody is trying. Because like I told you earlier, there were people who had tickets that indicated they could watch around 3 p.m. But they, they did not get access to the place at 3. Others have missed it at 5. And so this time, for some people, it is a make or break. Uh, seeing that it is also getting very late, people would want to watch this by all means. Uh, even though we have sections uh, tomorrow, this doesn't look good at all. This doesn't look good at all. And there's so much rush. There's so much rush here. I wonder if the tickets are still being checked. I wonder if people are still being screened, like it happened during the day. It doesn't look like that. And there seems to be a stampede right now at the entrance. Security officers must take charge of this. The situation right here is pretty chaotic right now. A mad rush into the Accra International Conference Center. Everyone here, hundreds and hundreds of people want to catch a glimpse of the latest investigative piece by Anas Arimbeya Anas. And if you could if you could watch from there, yeah, we still have lots of people coming in right now. We still have lots of people coming in right now. There is a mad rush hey, 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 for, for, for people are rushing into the Accredit International Conference Center. We do not know exactly what is happening right now, but there's this mad rush uh, into the Accredit International Conference Center. The security must take charge.
Uh, there seems to be some stampede at the end there. Uh, and everyone wants to catch it. I think this is the last section. Uh, this is the last one that Tiger Eye will be showing. And so that, is, that explains perhaps why there's this mad rush. And some of them have been waiting for a long time, since 3 p.m. Some have queued from 1 a.m. And uh, it, it looks very, very, very chaotic right now. People have even left their shoes. It is a make or break for some people. <laughs> Previously, you would have the security at this place. All right, so obviously there appears to be some chaos there at the Crown International Conference Center for the, where they're premiering the uh, documentary by investigative journalist Anas Aramia and Nas, number 12, as he, as he calls it. We would expect that the police, or there will be some backup. Obviously, there are some police officers there, but it appears that they are overwhelmed and we would ask the police to send some more men there to try and control the situation, it's, it's expected that people are eager to get to watch this documentary and uh, they, they badly want to see it and that's why they are converged there. All right, so we have uh, some more snippets of uh, the documentary which uh, we would be sharing with you. Let's watch that. No, I don't think it was a penalty. Right, so we're going back to the Crown International Conference Center and Esmenu is standing by. Let's uh, hope that there's been some, some order has been restored. Uh, hello, Ernest. Um, what, what can you say about the situation right now? Has some order been restored? Uh, some order, it looks like, uh, but I think that the security have taken charge of this. We're trying to get to the uh, entrance to the Accra International Conference Center, the main auditorium. What happens usually is that before you even get to the foyer, there are security checks, but all of that has been dismantled now, and the, 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 the tickets are being taken at the entrance to the auditorium. And so uh, we still have people out here. Just a while ago, it was a crazy, crazy rush. Um, they are checking the tickets at this point now, and uh, we still have a few people out there. People still want to get in to watch uh, this documentary because this is the last session, uh, we are told. And so uh, they are trying as much as possible. Security seems to have taken control right now. I will try and speak to some of the people who are here. Uh, um, we'll try and speak to them to get uh, and as, a and as before you be, as well. before you do uh, that Ernest, I know that there are people who are making their way to the Accra International Conference Center for the 10 p.m. showing but you're saying that this is going to be the last one and it's just about 8 30 because of what is happening uh, there's some consideration uh, they're not sure if this will happen but uh, people are still waiting uh, I think that is the news that uh, they, they have. I haven't uh, checked or verified. All right, because it would be it would be good. It would be good that if we can confirm, if we can confirm that information, that the 10 p.m. Uh, advertised Absolutely. 10 p.m. showing we'll can be, yeah. So we can let the our viewers know and the people Absolutely. who are making we'll them. 
we'll check with the organizers and the police as well uh, so that they can be informed. But that is the perception, the information that, you know, led to this mad rush. I don't know who told them, you know, uh, because they tell me that they have been told that this is the last one. And that is why everyone wants to get in there. Easy. All right. Now, Ernest... As, as, as it stands right now, I think the auditorium is full and they are not taking any more uh, people. So all the people out here would have to wait at 10 if that would come up. All right. And as I want to understand, how has it been? Now, one of the things that usually happens at these screenings or premieres is that you would have uh, Anas Aremia Anas come out there on stage and speak to the people. Has that happened? Well, at the uh, very first uh, screening, I, I didn't enter the auditorium early. Usually he would do that before and after. Before I wasn't there, I entered 30 minutes into the screening. I sat there for one and a half hours. After the event, he didn't address the gathering. And so, but I'm not sure if he did that earlier uh, at the start of the screening. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ernest Menu. And uh, do keep, uh, do continue to stand by for us if there's anything we would want to come to you in the course of the bulletin. That was Ernest Menu joining us, Ernest Menu, who is at the premiere of uh, number 12 that's a nurse's documentary investigative journal it's a nasa remy a nurse's documentary at the crown international conference center we're taking a break now to bring you sports news which definitely would have something to say about the anas aramia anas uh, documentary which was premiered at the crown international conference center to stay tuned and in the headlines, premiere of highly anticipated documentary on corruption in football in Ghana shows massive rot in the sport as much officials are seen receiving money to fix matches and influence decisions. The claims made on video by the Ghana Football Association president, Christian Yantechi, which has gotten him into some trouble, was finally shown to the audience. In a related development, the minority in parliament wants the Director General of the Police ID removed over the leakage to the media of a statement given to the police by the Ghana Football Association President. Also in Parliament, the MP for Asin Central Canadian Japan is to be hauled before the Privileges Committee for comment he made about the House. In business, President Kufuado announces process to find a partner for the creation of a new home-based carrier will be finalized by the end of the year. And thank you too for watching. My name is Israel. I have a good night.